Hello, I'm David D. Hilscher. I am a critical thinker, dissident scientist. I'm here to tell you the truth about science, something university professors won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly those science evangelists won't tell you. This is another gem from a friend, as I say. This is from Lori Gardee, the fractal lady. She talks about fractals and how they uh, work and maybe be a good model for black holes. Oh my gosh, that's pretty pretty amazing, isn't it? But she pointed out somebody who I've never seen before or heard until just today when I got an email for from her and says hey found another critical thinker on the internet his name is Robert Distinti and he is an electrical engineer how come it, it how come all those electrical engineers are so feet on the ground amazing scientists and real critical thinkers I'm guessing is because they have to re work with the real world real circuits real metals real electricity real fields the whole thing and because of that they are amazing at engineers and, in this case, great critical thinkers. So another electrical engineer, he started this web, uh, this YouTube channel, looks like in 2011. He's almost up to 200,000 views. He's even got a Patreon. He's got almost 2,000 subscribers. But I rec highly recommend you listen to this guy. He has, he's just breaking down the rules of how you do science. And it is quite amazing, and that's what we're going to take a look at it today. He does seem to be an etherist, I would guess, because he's talking about ethereal mechanics. That's his website, etherealmechanics.info. You can see it's pretty much just a bulletin board, but you can get in there and get your feet wet. But today I'm going to be talking, listening to some parts of his uh, discussion, his latest discussion. It's it's pretty new. I think it's within the last 24 hours, and he's redoing his. Uh, what he calls all of these uh, uh, ways of that he looks at the world to rules of acquisition. He's looking at those rules of acquisition, and I tell you, this is really, really. I was totally fascinated. Watched this whole thing. I can't wait to watch more of them. But I picked out certain areas that I thought were really interesting because it's on a theme that I'm going to be talking about a lot uh, from now and in the future. Let's let him talk about it. The cornerstone. I don't want to say supreme of another of under another of other rules of acquisition. For example, rule of acquisition 11.2, irrefutability does not prove exclusivity. In other words, just because you have a theory that gives you right answers does not prove that there's not another theory out there that can't give you the same equally good answers. Because when I did my graduate thesis and the dean of the School of Engineering said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm showing new models of electromagnetism. He goes, ridiculous, Maxwell's equations are irref irrefutable. Well, so what? That doesn't mean there's not another way. Because one of the differences between engineers and physicists, I, I don't understand what physicists are taught. They seem to be taught that there's only one right way. Engineers are taught over and over and over again there's more than one right way to solve a problem. Or uh, maybe I should say it differently. There's more than one way to solve a problem. Is, is this blasphemy or what? The guy's talking about there are more way, than one way to solve a problem. Isn't this something I've been saying all along? That you can have the same, you can have a phenomenon like gravity and maybe have five models that describe it. We have ether models. We have particle models. We have lattice models. We have action at a distant model, distance models. And there are probably other ones out there and all kinds of them. And you can't do that in science. He, he, he's right. Why is it that physics expects that we have this one thing that when we find I've talked about this many times when we find a some what we call law that all the people in the universe find that all the 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 intelligent beings are all going to find equals mc squared they're all going to have the mathematical system that we have they're all going to have the same models as we have because once we find the truth it's truth forever we can be like you know relativity uh where yeah I mean, uh, Newton, so Newton's so good until you get close to speed of light. Now you have relativity. But you see, you're only building on it. You haven't thrown away Newton, and you can't say Newton doesn't work as well. Or you certainly can't have a totally different model from everybody else. What? 
But this guy goes on and talk and shows you these three loops. He goes out there on the internet and finds equations and finds different, you know, theories or equations that all describe something in electrical engineering and he puts it to the test and he describes it's pretty darn amazing. I'm not going to go through that because I want you to read it. Now I'm going to get to another part here. So uh, bear with me. I got to get to uh, 1428 here and we'll listen to some more. There we go. and realize that because we may have a constrained footprint that there may be more than one model that fits this data and we have to go search for the other models like I did for the field model I did a computer search to find everything that would fit the inductance data and we, when we do our search we're going to have a polytheoristic answer polytheorism meaning more than one theory and this is great now that we know that there's more than one theory to fit the data what we have to do now is increase our footprint by increasing our ability to sample more tightly so that we can disambiguate. In other words, take a sample here and then if the dot comes here or the dot comes here, we would know which is the more truthful answer and which is the less truthful answer. Okay, rule of acquisition 1.1, because of our constrained footprint, we should expect and embrace polytheorism. That means when we have some empirical data, we should go find every possible way to explain that data. Every theory, every mathematical model. Because once we find, we can find more than one that gives excellent results, well then what we do is we go take more high detailed measurements to disambiguate which one it is. And therefore, we're instead of falling in love with the first one we got, imprinting like a little chicken, we're going to drive to the truth faster and faster. We're never going to get to the truth, but we're going to approach the truth faster and faster. Okay? And so, ah, now we increased our footprint, our ability to measure. Now we can measure at a higher uh, sample rate. And ah, now we've disambiguated. But don't assume you're done, because nature, nature can play a trick on you. And nature can still have another theory that fits even that expanded footprint. Boy, clicking all around, man, and getting all that wrong. He calls it polytheorism. What does he call it? We'll go back here and, and take a look here. Uh, there it is. Polytheorism. Polytheorism. I had never heard that word before. That is absolutely fantastic. He gives this great example where you see, oh, this looks all good until you get to here. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. There could be something else going on there very true amazing 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 this guy is really putting something out there that tells us the same thing that we're I've been trying to tell everybody and and other people have been talking about this as well we have different models we all should work on them we all should help each other because one model is going to do something better than us one example of that was during the if Vancouver conference of the CNPS in 2017 in beautiful Vancouver, my father was giving uh, a, uh, an interpretation using our model, the particle model, of why there are colors, different colors on a candle because of the different movements of the nucleons of the atoms. And you know what happened? Duncan Shaw, who is an etherist and has what I call the Vancouver ether, is a pretty neat model, a pretty very interesting model, says, hey, I can use that. Great. We're, like he says, like this guy's telling us, we get closer to the truth. No, we'll never get to the truth, ever. I mean, the universe is the universe, so we can't necessarily mimic everything in it. Because, well, according to Borkert, we certainly can't, and we'll never. And this guy says the same thing. My father says very much the same thing. But the idea is that we should be, this should be normal in physics. It should be normal. When you go to physics and you go to a university and, and, and want to be a physicist, it should be okay for you to come up with new models and, and people will be debating those models to see which ones will work. Will the etherists win out? Will the particle models win out? Will they be better than the other? We don't know. But if we don't try, we're not going to get anywhere. And like this guy says, our footprint, we're stuck. Our feet are stuck in the mud. This guy is worth watching. 
go subscribe to him. I am going to try to get a hold of him, maybe even get an interview with this guy because his stuff is fascinating. Please, please, please subscribe to him. Watch his stuff. He is a, a great critical thinker. He's got his own way of looking at the world and the way that we should be doing science. It is, boy, he is not easy. And I'm going to show you right here. I'm going to wrap this up and um, show you. He doesn't mince words when he criticizes. Okay, beware of anybody who states that they have irrefutable knowledge about what anything is. If you say, if they say, well, I know exactly that this is that and that's a that, I can tell you right now they're a complete moron. The best we can do is mimic what nature does. Knowing what something does is not knowledge of what it is. And that's the third rule of acquisition, which is the utility fallacy, which reads, monkey do, does not mean monkey no. I don't want to go and give you the whole thing. I can sit there and watch that. That's my problem. That's why you see me editing this because I get so fascinated where things are, what things are doing, uh, what this guy is saying. But this is a true critical thinker. Watch his stuff. I am going to. I'm totally new. I've subscribed to his channel. Um, I am absolutely on board with his polytheorism. That is let's use the models that we have. Ether models work very well with certain things. We have uh, Jeff Yee with his really great Ether model coming uh, and he's explaining that. Subscribe to his channel. We have the particle model. Subscribe to youtube.particle.guru. We have a guy talking all about time and what that is. We need to look at all these things. That's Nick of Time. And we have the Infinity Guru coming because I just read his book, An Amazing Guy. Infinity is an amazing subject, and in my opinion, and this is mine, because there aren't everybody who shows, some people believe it's infinity all the way down, but not up, I believe up and down. But infinity as a concept is really, really important for us to understand for all of our models. And so all of these things are there. And remember, don't take my word for it. Look at this stuff yourself. Subscribe to this guy. Uh, I don't take his word for it, my word for it, anybody's word for it. Look at it. Stay critical, stay thinking. I am Dave D. Hoster, your science therapist. Ciao for now.